Thanks for the invitation. I'm uh, really pleased to be here with you today. It's uh, always a pleasure to share what we are doing in space with uh, uh, young and motivated people. And uh, I know that you all are motivated by space and what we might find in space also. Um, so um, as uh, Hervé mentioned, I, I had a couple of mi uh, space missions. First one was 20 years ago. Second one, 10 years ago, and nothing this year. So yes, this happens often. <laughs> uh, I don't expect to fly any other mission, so I, I will have more time in the future to, to share um, the, the time I spend there for working and enjoying the space flight with uh, a lot of people. Um, my first mission was in the Mir space station. It was a short one, three weeks. We, we had, a, it was in the 90s and 98, uh, we had a, at that time uh, French-Russian missions, bilateral missions. Uh, so it was mainly for uh, performing uh, French experiments in the, in the Russian space station. Then I joined the, the European Space Station Agency. For my first mission, I was working with the CNES, which is a French space agency. And in 98, all the European astronauts have been merged, the national astronauts have been merged into a single core of European astronauts within the European Space Agency. And uh, so I joined ESA, the European Space Agency, in uh, 1998. And I was assigned uh, to uh, immediately, to, I, I've been assigned in Houston for um, being trained on the Space Shuttle and Space International Space Station. That was the first class in Houston to be trained for the International Space Station, which was just starting at that moment in 1998. And uh, that was, that's already 20 years ago. <laughs> you can, it's hard to imagine that. Um, and I had actually my, my mission on, in the ISS only 10 years after, for different reasons, uh, but in particular due to the um, accident of the Columbia uh, Space Shuttle in 2003, which delayed the, the program by three years, at least for the non-US, uh, non-Russian non, non part of the station. Um, so I, f I flew in 1998 for a two months mission as a member of the uh, International Space Station, but I went up and down with the Space Shuttle, which is not what is happening today. You probably know that uh, the shuttle program was terminated in 2011 after the, the completion of the assembly of the International Space Station. So what you see here, at least all the part which is not Russian is, has been built thanks to the, the, the big cargo bay of the, of the US shuttle. And if we would want today to build the same station, we couldn't do it because we don't have the shuttle, the space shuttle anymore. So that's uh, important to remember that. And it took more or less 13 years to build the station. So there were some changes a little bit since 2011 when this picture was taken, but uh, nothing really significant. It's just a reconfiguration more than add, adding new modules. We will see that a little bit later. So this, this is a um, presentation about how is the ISS today and what, what we are doing in the ISS and uh, how is the life of the astronauts, the operations. So it's a very general one, but there will be a few details, as you will notice, and uh, I hope I will be able to, uh, to make this presentation in one hour, and then, of course, we'll have some questions, and I'll be ready to answer your questions. So, the crew. So that's the current crew. So, as you see, there are six people in the station. You might see that these three guys up here are a little bit grayed. That's because they didn't arrive yet. So we are today in, uh, in a, a pe period of rotation of the crew. So three crew members returned uh, last week, actually. And uh, so now we have just uh, the three ones that you see here on the bottom. Um, and uh, the uh, three other ones will arrive on uh, the 23rd of March. So you can see the dates here. Um, and they we arrived in the Soyuz. These guys arrived in the Soyuz in December 2017, and they will return in June. So you see that duration of the mission is six months. So that's a standard now. Um, 
And these three ones will arrive in March and they will stay until August. So that's also around six months. So that's the standard duration of, uh, of, the, um, of the missions for the astronauts and cosmonauts today. Um, that might change. It was not the case in the past. It might be a little bit shorter when the, when the space shuttle was also doing the rotations of the crew. But uh, now it's standard because the only way to, uh, to carry the people to the station is the Russian uh, spacecraft, the Soyuz. And the, the life duration of the Soyuz in space is six months. So that's the reason why the crews are staying six months in the station. Um, so as you see, it goes by group of three because that's the, what the Soyuz can do. We can only carry three people. So it's rotating by group of three. So usually there are four Soyuz which are flying every year, two in spring and two in uh, fall. And uh, so that makes the rotation. So we have uh, more or less 12 people flying every year in the station. And now we have a permanent crew of six, but when I was on board, it was three only. So this crew of six uh, started in 2011, I think, 2011. So you see, we have uh, currently three Americans. We will have three, Amer three Americans, two Russians, and one Japanese astronaut on board. The Japanese might be a European astronaut. It might be um, also um, a Canadian astronaut. So there is one seat, let's say, which is for astronauts who are not Russian or who are not American. So. Every other Soyuz, every two Soyuz, there is one non-Russian, non-American astronaut flying. That's the share of the owners of the station. So the big uh, owners, of course, are NASA and the Russian Space Agency, so the Russians and the Americans. And uh, uh, there is one crew member, every other mission, who is not uh, American or Russian. And uh, in... Uh, June, when these people will return, we will have a, a European astronaut flying again, a German astronaut, Alexander Guest, who will replace uh, the, one of the crew members. Um, you see that the, 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 the commander of the station is Russian uh, currently, but it's rotating, so he can be American, and sometimes also non-Russian or non-American can be commander of the station. And you see also that it's 55th, 55th crew of the station. When I flew 10 years ago, it was Expedition 16, so it was the 16th crew. So we had in 10 years uh, almost 40 um, uh, crews. And uh, as I told you, since 2011, uh, now we, are, we have six crew members for it's, it's what we call Expedition, which is the crew of the space station, actually. Um, yeah, so I think that's all I can say for the time being. You might have some questions later. This will not be, this is not the end. I mean, we will have in the future seven crew members, but this is not, this is in, we are in the phase of, uh, let's say, reconfiguring the station for, um, for that, uh, for these seven crew member, uh, crew members. And, um, this will ha happen only because we will have in the future, uh, soon, we hope, uh, another vehicle which will uh, carry uh, the crew members to the station, which will be a, a US commercial vehicle. So actually there will be two ones, one which is built by Boeing and the other one which will be built by uh, SpaceX. And uh, this, this uh, spacecraft will carry four people. So we will have the possibility to rotate four and three with the Soyuz, which will continue, but there will be only one Soyuz and one U.S. Uh, commercial vehicle, which will allow us to have a crew of seven people on board. But that's for, we hope, end of next year. Because the commercial companies which are building these new vehicles, they have to test them and they have to demonstrate, of course, that th these vehicles are reliable. So that's very important, of course, <laughs> for everybody. And uh, so there will be a transition period bef before we are able to to reach this uh, crew of uh, seven crew members, this uh, for the for the ISS. All right, I'm talking too much. So, 
the housing, okay. So this is these pictures, as you see, this picture was taken in May 2011. Why? Because all these pictures that you see of the International Space Station, they have been taken by the crew member inside the US shuttle. So that's why we, we don't see really recent pictures of this, the, the ISS from outside. And because the shuttle, when it, it was undocking from the space station, it was going, doing a, what we call a fly around and was taking pictures and videos to see the external state of the structure. And um, so all these pictures were archival, uh, kind of old, let's say, but um, they are uh, relatively up to date uh, because, the, as, as I told you, the, the station didn't change so much for a few years. Um, so roughly, um, everything we allow, you see the orientation of the station here. So if you if you compare it to an airplane, for instance, this would be the wings. This would be the, the fuselage here. So these these are the pressurized modules. So that's where there is life inside, actually. Uh, <clears throat> everything here is not, of course, cannot be uh, manned and, uh, and is not pressurized. So that's the main truss, the solar arrays, the radiators of the station here, and solar arrays again. <clears throat> and all these modules only are uh, manned. This is a European vehicle, which, is, which was called the ATV. That's a cargo vehicle that we built five of them. And now it's, we don't build them anymore. So the, whoops, sorry. The last one flew in 2015. It was the biggest cargo for the, for the uh, resupply of the station. And uh, it, will, it was built by the European Space Agency. So this picture is from 2011. I think that was the second one. Yeah, it's ATV2, so that's the second one. <clears throat> but we don't build that anymore. So the station is oriented more or less. I, I told about an airplane. As you can see it here, that's, that's the, the, the usual orientation of the station. This is uh, because it's optimized for solar power. These solar arrays that you see here, they are turning to follow the sun. But this orientation of the station allows to, have the, to optimize the power generation on board the station. So that's why we have most of the time this orientation. But it can be changed, actually. We are out of the atmosphere, so it can be changed. So this is it going, it's uh, flying in, in this direction. I, I, usually I have an arrow here, but <laughs> I don't see it. Um, so it's flying in this direction here. So this is the front and this is the aft of the station. Uh, the front part, as you can see, there is the Columbus module that we delivered when I flew in 2008. We brought this module here, which is a Columbus module, European module. This is the Japanese side, which arrived a little bit after my mission in 2000. Eight and nine. Uh, all this part here, you will see that better in uh, in the picture that I have uh, after. This is the the U.S. part of the station, and the uh, aft part here is the Russian side. So this this module here is called the FGB. That was the first one, which was launched in uh, 1998. That was the uh, let's say the first block of the station and the station grew around this, uh, this, sorry, this uh, block uh, which was built by the Russian, but which is owned by NASA actually, by the Americans. Um, and uh, the first crew uh, in, 19, in 2000, in the year 2000, the first crew was able to, to live in this uh, part of the station, which is the Russian, what we call the set Russian service module, which is the main module of the Russian side. And that's the um, very similar to what was the uh, the core module of of the uh, Mir space station 20 years ago. It has been, of course, uh, improved, but it's uh, very similar to the the core module of the Mir space station. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about Canada. Sorry. <coughs> Canada is also one of our partners. I told you, and I talk about the crews, but uh, they are, they don't have a module, a dedicated module. They have, they are building all the robotics. And this is, this is and this was very important when we built the station also. 
So the, the, there is a robotic arm here. There is a sort of robotic hand also, which can be attached to the arm and detached from the arm. So this was used, as I told you, for building the station to, you know, to, to grapp grapple the, uh, the modules in the cargo bay of the shuttle and attach them to the, to the station during the assembly. But now it can be used for many things, and uh, especially for when we have cargo vehicles arriving, we can take some external cargo and install it in the station. Um, it, can be, it can be used also to carry astronauts who are working outside the station. Uh, it can be used for changing equipment outside in the station also. Um, so this is very, very, very useful and very important for the, uh, um, the work and for the maintenance of the International Space Station. Yeah, I told you about this uh, picture here, which is uh, the elements by partner. Uh, so you can see the big blue, I mean the big share is blue here. Uh, that's NASA, of course. We have the Russian side here. <coughs> this module is expected for a long time. The Russians, they, they're supposed to, to bring this module, which is called the MLM, that scientific module. Um, but it has been delayed several years, so now it's expected end of, end of 2008, but we're not sure that this will happen actually in, uh, in the end of this year. Uh, this is the European module, as you can see, and uh, the Japanese side of the station, and the robotics Canadian elements here. So you can see, the, you can see why also, looking at these colors, uh, we have three or four Americans two Russians and only one Japanese or one Canadian or one European. So this is showing also the, uh, the, uh, the share of the ownership of the station. So this translates into astronaut missions and also into crew time for what we call the utilization of the station, which means uh, science and uh, everything that's that's utilization. So it's mainly science, mechanic, technology, education, all these activities that the astronauts are doing. Uh, there is also a limited crew time per partner for that. That's part of the original agreements between the different partners. Okay, so a few a few numbers, uh, a few. Uh, features here. Um, so you see the size of, that's an American football, but well, it's like a soccer field more or less. Uh, so it's about uh, 100 meters in this direction, 50 meters in this direction, used to be 20 meters of uh, thickness. Uh, it's a little bit less now because we, we changed the position of one of the modules. Um, the mass is around 420 tons. Um, the speed Altitude first, 400 kilometers, so that's close to the Earth, not far away, but just above the atmosphere. And the velocity is about 20,200 kilometers per hour, which means 7.7 .7 kilometers per second, which is, uh, <clears throat> as you probably know, the velocity which is needed when, you, when we are at this altitude, 400 kilometers, to stay in orbit. Orbital inclination, we'll see that in a minute, 51.6 degrees, pressurized volume. It's hard to imagine what it is exactly, but I would say a few buses, more or less, maybe uh, four or five buses for the pressurized part, uh, which is quite a lot for six, six uh, crew members, actually. I remember that once when we were three, I, I was trying to find one of my colleagues, my Russian colleagues, and I couldn't find him. <laughs> I guess he was hiding for taking a nap for a few minutes. But <laughs> so that's a big station. Orbital period, 91 minutes. That's the time we need to, to do one orbit, of course. So first thing you see, it's very close from the Earth. If you think that the, diame uh, the uh, radius of the Earth is about 6,400 kilometers, so that's very close, 400 kilometers. That's visible here. You see the uh, inc inclination of the orbits here. I was mentioning that 51 degrees. That's the angle we have with the equator of the disk which is carrying the orbit. So more or less this disk is fixed in space. And of course the Earth is rotating beneath. 
So you see that each time we in the, in the next uh, orbit, of course, we will be more west, and it takes about 15 or 16 orbits for the Earth to have a complete 24-hour rotation. Um, what else do we see here? We, we don't fly over the poles, so we cannot see the poles even if at 400 kilometers we can see far away, about a radius that what we can see is about 2,000 kilometers. So we can see far away here, but we cannot see the, 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 the poles. Okay. Um, Actually, this disk is turning a little bit slowly to the west. So there is, uh, this is due to, to the, the fact that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. And uh, so that <coughs> there are some uh, tricks with the gravity. So the orbit is a little bit rotating. And as you can see, the, uh, this is the sun. The station is not flying uh, each time directly under the sun. I mean, the sun can be high can be low, a little bit like on the Earth. So that's why also the, uh, the solar arrays are not only rotating in, in this direction, in what pitch, what we call pitch in aviation, but they're also rotating to the side because the sun can be also on the side a little bit. You know that you can see the station, right? As I told you, the Earth is rotating and uh, the station, on the, the orbit of the station, so it's, it's uh, flying more and more west. So it can fly over any uh, location which is located between uh, plus 51 and minus 51 latitudes. Okay, uh, so that's where we are here. We are below the 51, so we can see the station. Uh, um, the conditions to see it, it has to be, the, the, the station itself has to be in the sunlight and we have to be in the, in the obscurity more or less. So that means we can see it only in the morning or in the evening. Okay, And uh, of course the station has to fly above us, that's one condition. Um, and uh, of course uh, the sky has to be clear, that's <laughs> an important thing. That's, that's the same when we are on board. If we want to take pictures we, we need clear skies also for, uh, to make pictures of the ground. Um, so here it tells you when I'm trying to find uh, so, in order to see it, the, the station doesn't emit any light, okay? So, so, if we want to see it, it has to be in, in the sunlight itself, and uh, it's very bright, actually. I don't know if some of you saw it before, but it's very bright, and you can see it crossing the sky in a few minutes. So, for uh, this region here, I, may, I know that some of you are coming from other parts of the world. <laughs> okay, so the launch, <clears throat> as I told you, today, it's only with a Russian vehicle, the Soyuz. So we have to go to Kazakhstan for the launch, and uh, um, that happens four times during the year. So that was a launch of uh, Thomas Pesquet, who is the last French astronaut to, to fly in the, who flew in the, in the International Space Station. He flew in, uh, he launched in, two, in November 2016, and uh, he returned in June of last year. And it was a night launch. It can be night, day, uh, winter, uh, summer, any time, of course. Um, <clears throat> and this uh, this launcher is very old, but it has been, of course, upgraded. But uh, that's more or less the same launcher which was used for the first man to fly in space, uh, Yuri Gagarin, in 1961. But it has been improved again. But uh, it's it's a very reliable launcher, and uh, it's called the Soyuz also. In, in, in Russian, Soyuz means Union, <coughs> and the, the spacecraft also is called Soyuz, and it carries three people. So, what is the objective? You see the launcher is oriented, of course, vertically, so we're going to go fly first vertically. So, what's, what's the purpose of flying vertically? Because we, we want to be in orbit with a hori horizontal speed, right? <coughs> so, do you have a, an idea why we have to launch vertically first? <laughs> Escape the atmosphere. <clears throat> there is, of course, an atmospheric drag, which is, um, of course, act, acting on the vehicle. So we want to go uh, as, as fast as possible out of the atmosphere. And the best way to do it is to fly vertically. But you will notice that it started already to uh, um, rotate, to, be, to finish with a horizontal uh, orientation. And uh, <clears throat> actually, most of the, during two minutes, we will fly 
with a relatively vertical attitude and then uh, it will go more and more horizontal and will finish only with a pure horizontal uh, inclination for to be able to accelerate in the direction of the orbit. Okay, so the, the launch itself between the T0 of the launch and the, when you reach orbit, it's about 8 minutes and, and 50 seconds. So it takes, it's very uh, quick, but takes time, uh, especially for, uh, for a video. <laughs> so we, we actually have three people. So here we are about two minutes into the flight. And uh, you see the, the launcher is still in a relatively vertical attitude. That was the first stage separation. You saw the four boosters being separated. And uh, <clears throat> we'll continue to climb, but we will be more and more horizontal, as I told you. So here you can see we are about now three minutes. So it's about 45 degrees uh, orientation, attitude. Um, <clears throat> we are in the second stage. So now we are in the that's the end of the second stage. It's about 300 seconds or so five minutes. Uh, 300 seconds, yeah. Um, and uh, so we are two thirds almost into the into the flight. So you see, we are now on the third stage. The second stage has been separated, and you probably saw also that the fairing, the protection around the Soyuz, the, the the crew vehicle, which is here, has been jettisoned because we are out of the atmosphere and we're almost horizontal now. So I will show you how we arrive in orbit. You will see that it's interesting because the, the engine will stop, of course, and then it's like, you know, hitting a wall almost. So you're going from three Gs to zero Gs in, in uh, less than a second. So you probably see that here with looking at the dog, by the way. You see the, cr the crew is very quiet. There is nothing really to do during the, during the launch. It was quite rough. <coughs> anyway, that's the way you, you reach the orbit. And uh, and then you have to fly and, and uh, do the, what we call the rendezvous and docking, and docking with the station. So that's the vehicle when it's separated from the... Um, when it's separated from the, uh, the launcher. So there are three parts in this vehicle. Uh, three parts in the vehicle. Um, this is the part that we saw just before, where the crew... The central part here is where the crew is during the launch and for the return. So that's the most protected one. This one is protected also for the re-entry of the vehicle. When we, we come back, uh, we need to protect because of the high temperatures which are involved when you are doing the atmospheric re-entry. Um, so this part is really the safe part of the, of the vehicle. Uh, the front part here is, the, is used only in orbit. That's called the orbital module. So that gives the crew more space when you are on orbit. And it's also where the you have some equipment like the docking probe here, which is used for catching the station and, and attaching, do the initial attachment to the station. And the aft part is not pressurized here, and so you cannot get inside it. And it's for the engines, uh, tanks, uh, propellants, and for the solar arrays and all these kind of things. And uh, these three parts are separated when you return to Earth. In three, in uh, they are se se separated, and then these two ones are the, the the orbital module and the service module are burning in the atmosphere, and the central part is protected and returning the crew, and then you will see that later uh, landing under a parachute. So usually it takes two days. Uh, well, in the past it took two days 
to do the rendezvous with the station and dock. So that's quite a long time in a small vehicle, you can see. Um, but the Russians managed to, to improve that and uh, for a few years now they are able to uh, join the station in <coughs> four orbits, so that's about six hours be be between the launch and the docking. Which is of course uh, very uh, good for the, for the crew, uh, but that makes also a very long day because the day of the launch started very early so you have to, to, uh, to get into the vehicle and I mean to, to prepare uh, several hours before the launch and you have to get inside the vehicle and then you have to do the launch, and the, the rendezvous, the docking and then you have a few things to do when you arrive in the station so that makes a very big, very long day. Having two days it was not too bad I think but uh, except the fact that you were in a, in a very confined module during uh, 48 hours. So that was the docking of Thomas Pesquet and his crew in November 2016. Um, <clears throat> so he, he had a two-day, a two-day, 48 hours rendezvous. And uh, this is a final phase. So the final um, speed for the docking, uh, I mean the relative speed between the, 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 the vehicle and the station, it's a few centimeters per second, around 30, 35 centimeters per second. So that's very slow, of course, in, in terms of relate, relative speed, relative velocity, you can see that here. <coughs> and um, <coughs> there are four docking ports on the Russian side of the, of the station, where you can have usually two Soyuz, two crew vehicles docked, and two um, cargo vehicles docked. So. <clears throat> that's usually what, what we have docked to the station. So it, each time you have, for, for six crew members, you will need to have two, two Soyuz docked to the station, of course, because that's also the, the, um, the lifeboat of the station. If there is anything, any problem with the station, you want to escape, you want to do an emergency return, you need to have your vehicle, of course. So that's why we have two Soyuz for when there are six people on board. And as of now, uh, be before the, we, we just have three, we just have one Soyuz, obviously. And this is the final approach and docking. You see it's, it's, very, it's very slow. So it's fully manual process? Well, it's, in principle, it's automatic, but it can be manual. If, if the, uh, there is something wrong, the commander can take over and fly it manually. So the thrusters fire automatically? Uh, excuse me? So the thrusters fire automatically? Yes, yeah, in principle it's automatic. But it happens regularly that the, the commander takes, takes over. And the, and, the, and the crew are, 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 is trained for that, of course. Okay. Uh, usually when you arrive, you have a, what we call PAO, so that's a public event. That's, actually, that's not so much public. It's mainly a, a, tele, a tele video conference with the... Uh, with the ground and with the uh, Moscow control center. Uh, and uh, the, the crew is talking to the officials, of course, and also to their family. So that's just after the arrival of the Soyuz in general. So that's a nice moment. But that, that was a very long day, so they are probably very tired at that moment also. And this is one of the docking ports that you can see here on the Russian side. So uh, this vehicle was docked on underneath the station, for instance. That's the usual place for one Soyuz, the other one being on top here, uh, on the other, uh, on the, um, the top side of the Russian uh, side of the station. There is another docking port here. And what you see here is a uh, Russian cargo. That's another docking port. And there is another one on the aft here, which can also be used by a Russian cargo and was used also by the, by the ISA cargo, the ATV in the past. So working, um, I try probably to be a little faster. Um, <clears throat> as I told you, that's a six months mission, just to give you, to show you the scheme. Um, this is the duration of, that was for uh, our French astronauts. So that the, the three crew members, they going up with the Soyuz, so that starts here. Soyuz is, last, is uh, lasting six months in space. So that's the duration of their mission. And so you see the other Soyuz is on top here. So you see that this one is leaving earlier and there is another one arriving and uh, which all these Soyuzes are again uh, staying six months attached to the station. So the crew is staying 
six months uh, six months attached to the station. Um, <clears throat> here you have all the docking ports. Uh, so these are the Russian ones on the top here, and you have the American docking ports on the on the bottom here. So you see that not all on the American side. Currently, it's not all uh, filled with uh, with vehicles, but it will be the case again uh, in the future. So I will show you the the U.S. vehicles later, but there are also four docking ports just to let you know on the on the U.S. side. And the mission's standard duration is six months again. So this is the, the what the crew sees see uh, every morning on its plate for the day. Okay, so that's the, the, the plan, the work plan of the day, let's say. So that's on the computer, of course. You have the six crew members here. You have all the activities that they have to do. What you see here in, with the, in what they call DPC, it's a daily conference. So in the morning and in the evening, there is a conference with the ground control centers, with all of them, which, la which is lasting about 15 minutes. So these start usually around 8. Uh, yeah, uh, first, I forgot to tell you, but the station is working in GMT. So that's more or less the uh, UK time. Uh, or the English time. Um, so that's very convenient when you're working on the ground in Europe because you will have to work with the station in your normal working hours. You don't have to, sh to sleep shift I, I, as it is the case in the US or in Japan, for instance, <coughs> and even in, in, in Russia a little bit, somehow. Um, so what the times that you see here, that's GMT. The, so that's a standard uh, station working time. And all the blocks here are the activities for each crew member. So if, if you click on this, you will have a lot of information coming with all your procedures, what you have to do, your procedures, the, the storage, what we call the storage locations. So that's where all the tools and equipment that you need are for these activity and so on. So you have plenty of detail when you click on this, but that's actually what the crew sees every morning. And what you have here on the top, that's the communication uh, with the station, between the ground and the station. There, there is a network of satellites, communication satellites, which are in uh, um, geosynchronous orbit and uh, which are relaying the, um, the communications and data and commands also for the different uh, control centers around the world. We have a, a control center in Houston for the, the station systems and US systems, of course. We have one in uh, um, Huntsville, Alabama for US payloads. We have one in Europe, uh, in Munich, for uh, the Columbus module and the European experiments. We have uh, one in Moscow for the Russian part of the station and one in uh, Japan, uh, near Tokyo, it's called Tsukuba, um, for the, uh, the, the um, Japanese activities, obviously. And we, you see that we have communications almost continuously during the day. See here, there are some, sometimes some breaks in communication, but not too much, which was not the case at all with the Mir space station 20 years ago. We had communications maybe 10, 20 minutes per day sometimes, so it was not, we, we didn't talk too much to the ground. Logistics, I will show you all the, the, the cargo vehicles. So this is a Russian cargo vehicle, which is called the Progress. It's very similar, you might have noticed, to the, uh, to the crew vehicle but it's a cargo vehicle only. And uh, I think <coughs> the, that's, that's the one which is the most used. Uh, we have, I think we are reaching now the 70th, 70 uh, progress vehicles launched by the Russians since the beginning of the program. So that's a very important one, of course. This is a Japanese vehicle. And you can see that the Japanese vehicle is uh, on the, on the Russian side, the vehicles like the Soyuz are docking automatically. That's not the case on the U.S. side. The, the, the Japanese vehicle is docking to on, the, on the U.S. side of the station, but it's just coming and flying near the station and then it's grappled by the robotic arm of the station. So the crew is grappling the vehicle and then install it in the, to, the, to the station. So that's the robotic arm that you can see here and this it has been catched here or grappled here. And, um, <clears throat> and then it will be installed like a normal module uh, to the, on, the, on the US side of the station. So it's called HTV for the Japanese vehicle, 
Kunotori, which is a bird, I think. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure which one, but <laughs> that's a bird. That's the name of the vehicle. And the, the seventh one is expected now. So this is one of, I was talking initial, in the beginning of my presentation about the US commercial vehicles. I talked, I, I talked about the crew vehicles, crew commercial vehicles. That's the future. But we have now a set of, of two US commercial cargo vehicles. One is uh, launched and uh, built and launched by SpaceX. It's called the Dragon. We had. Uh, I think now we will have the 14th one arriving. This started in uh, 2012, I think. But, but we're expecting the 14th one already. Particularity of this uh, Dragon vehicle, you see the shape here. It looks like the, uh, you, I don't know if you remember, the Apollo capsules. So this is the shape which is clearly will return to Earth. Okay, so that's the only cargo vehicle which is allowing to bring some equipment or experiments or whatever back to Earth in the, in the, you know, of course in a good, in a good uh, state. Um, <clears throat> the other vehicles, they are just burning into the atmosphere when, when they're returned, so they are used mainly for, uh, for the trash. So they are, once they have delivered the cargo <clears throat> and all the cargo has been transferred, the crew will transfer all the trash in these vehicles and this, all this will burn in the atmosphere and uh, um, so that's, that's the way we are getting rid of all the station trash. But this vehicle, the SpaceX Dragon, is able to bring some, some uh, cargo back. This is another vehicle which is called uh, Cygnus. That's a, the company is Orbital ATK. Um, you see the, so this one is, is not bringing back anything. So it's, it's really, if you look at it, it's really like a module of the station. So it's, uh, it's used only for to deliver the uh, logistics and, uh, and to bring back the trash. And this will also be grappled by the arm, the robotic arm of the station, and uh, will be attached uh, to the station like a normal module on the US side. When a vehicle arrives, uh, <clears throat> there, you see there is a lot of cargo. This is uh, Thomas Pesquet and Peggy Whitson. They, are, they have just opened the, the, the hatch of one of these vehicles. I think that's a Dragon here. SpaceX 10, yes, it's Dragon. And you see it's filled up to the, almost to the hatch here. So there, 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 there are a lot of things to transfer when, uh, when these vehicles arrived, of course. And there are also some external cargo on the other side of this uh, uh, Dragon vehicle, which is, uh, which is used for installing with a robotic arm external uh, equipment outside the station. So you see they're wearing goggles and masks because we are never sure when we open the hatch there will be no debris floating. Uh, it's usually clean before the launch, but you never know. So there might be some metal pieces of metal or, or small dust of metal which is flying in, uh, in, in weightlessness, of course. So that's why they're wearing these masks and goggles. But uh, when, when we are sure it's clean, then we can get rid of the mask and goggles. So science, uh, we, this was a program for just ESA, the European Space Agency, and CNES, which is a French space agency, for the mission of Thomas Pesquet, who is our French, last French, uh, French astronaut who flew in the station. So that was just a program for the uh, European Space Agency and the French Space Agency. So you can imagine that <coughs> there is the same <coughs> A number or at least and more than that even um, for, for the other partners and especially for the, the, the US also they have a long list of, of, of payloads. I think that overall for each um, what we call increment so mission duration of an astronaut there are around 200 experiments to perform during the, during the mission so that's of course a lot and that's today really the, the, the the, the, the important part of the work of the astronauts on board. And that's what actually the station was made for, to perform science and, and, and technology experiments and so on. So this is just to give you a flavor. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this, there are a lot of details here. I will not stay a, lot, uh, a long time on, on this, but you have what is important is see the different disciplines of science which are tackled during a, during our um, 
science for our science activities in the station, biology, biotechnology, earth and space science, education and cultural activities, human research of course, physical science, technology de development and demonstration. So the station is not only dedicated to fundamental science but also to prepare for the future. So we are also developing the technologies, the, uh, the new operations, etc., which, which, which will be used when we uh, go further and we continue to explore the uh, uh, space with uh, um, I'm talking about human exploration, of course. Um, so I will not go too much into the details, but I as I told you, for instance, for now, 50, uh, Expedition 55 and 56, you see we have 184 ex experiments, so that's almost 200. And since the beginning of the station, um, I think, I don't see the number here, but I think now it's about 2,400 2, experiments which have been completed. This is the Air Force. Um, so this is a scientific work here. Um, for instance, this is an instrument which was used to, to, uh, to measure muscle atrophy. You know that we are working in weightlessness. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of these. Uh, weightlessness is fun, but it's not the friend of, <laughs> of the human being, actually. Um, and and the, it creates a lot of problems, in particular on muscles, bones, and uh, uh, other things. And uh, so this experiment was dedicated to measure the atrophy of muscle during a six-month mission. So this was, uh, this has been done recently during the Thomas Pesquet mission, so it, that was in 2017, last year. And here it's helped by a Russian crew member. So you see that's in, inside the Columbus module, the European module. So you see how it's crowded here. A lot of equipment, cables, all, everything has been deployed and you can imagine everything has to be restored after that. So that's a lot of work, actually. So this is another experiment which is called Fluidix, uh, which was a, a French space agency experiment. In that case, the, the behavior of fluids in uh, weightlessness is something very important, of course, uh, not only for fundamental science, but also for, for the... Uh, the, the, the um, uh, space operations for the satellites, for the, uh, um, the, the vehicles, uh, of course, because we have a lot of fluids uh, and if, uh, if we want to optimize the behavior of fluids, we have to study how they behave in weightlessness. And there is a lot of progress which is done continuously in that area for years and years now. That's another experiment, that's a NASA one, this one, um, which is uh, <coughs> which has to do with education also. The idea is to fly um, spheres. It's, it's, that's the name of the experiment, to fly spheres in, uh, you know, in close together. And, uh, and the, the software, this is an experiment which has been taking place for several years now, and the software is actually developed by students. It can be changed, so, so there are challenges which are, which are organized between the different schools and students. And, so that's uh, an interesting uh, experiment which has been there for quite a, quite a long time now. And that's more in the, in the area of education, which is also something that we are, which is very important in the uh, astronaut activities on board. Um, <clears throat> this is another, here we are in the area of uh, technology demonstration. You can see this module here. It's an inflatable module. So it has been launched, attached to the, uh, so this is on the U.S. side here, but uh, looking aft. And then it has been inflated, and uh, it's, uh, it's allowing to study the, uh, this kind of technology for the future. Inflatable habitats, this is something that might be important for the future. And it's mainly, it was originally mainly dedicated to, to study the atmosphere inside the module, because, of course, you can imagine an inflatable, inflatable module that's um, very special material and uh, they are off gassing so we this kind of problems of course in the future might be important to know if we can use inflatable modules and have a um, non toxic not toxic atmosphere inside the module and this kind of uh, objectives of uh, for these uh, technology experiments um, and uh, now it's used uh, i think it was 
designed to stay uh, two years for this uh, technology demonstration. And now it's used as a storage module. We, we are, it's very important storage on board. I talked about that a little bit later, but uh, it's now a storage module. Spacewalks, this is also something which is happening from time to time. Uh, regularly, I would say. This is uh, Thomas, of course, who went outside. He was, I don't know if I should, should have a video here somewhere, but let's see. Well, <clears throat> okay, so the video is here now. <clears throat> so that was his first spacewalk, and uh, they are regularly, I mean, uh, spacewalks in the station, maybe on the Russian side, maybe on the US side, but they are usually maybe 10 what we call EVA, extravehicular activities, every year. It might be for maintenance of the station, it might be for, for, for installing experiments outside the station or for repairing something. Sometimes it might be for contingency reasons because something is breaking outside the station and the crew has to go out and, uh, and change something. And uh, <clears throat> in that case, that was an upgrade of the station batteries. And Thomas Pesquet was part of this um, <clears throat> this uh, EVA. Uh, that's another one that he did in March 2017. He's uh, lubricating the, uh, uh, some of the mechanism of the robotic arm of the station. So that's also maintenance activities. Here he was testing. Uh, there was some problem of leaks in the thermal loop, outside thermal loop of the station and he was trying to find if um, there was a leak somewhere. So he, this was spotted by the ground controllers, but uh, it has to be to use the astronaut to, to check, uh, what, to do what uh, we call troubleshooting, uh, to see if there were some leaks in some part of the external thermal control system of the station. Robotics, I mentioned that before. That's a nice picture because it shows, shows you all the robotics elements of the, of the station. Um, <clears throat> you have the robotic arm here, which is uh, existing from the beginning, almost from the first uh, four or five years of the station. This is uh, the robotic hand I was mentioning also, and this can be disconnected here, here at least. Uh, no, yeah, here. Um, the robotic hand is used to do some finer tasks, you know, like um, screwing and screwing or drilling sometimes or doing this kind of thing <clears throat> that you cannot do with the main arm, which is more used for, you know, grappling, grappling big modules than for doing fine tasks. Um, you see the arm here is based, what we call the MBS, mobile by system. So there is a, a rail track on the forward truss of the station and there is a sort of wagon if you want uh, on this track and it, it can move and the arm itself can be attached to this wagon and can move and if it's moving it can reach things which are further on the left on the right of the tr of the truss or whatever yeah. another important feature about the arm you can walk the station so you see that they are, so the, the arm is starting here. So you see that what we call the end effector, the, so that's the tip of the arm. And there is another end effector here, which is exactly the same, okay? And throughout the station, you have what we call grapple fixtures, so which you can grapple with these end effectors, with these tips of the arm. So for instance, in that case, the arm is connected to the station here, but if you can imagine that it would grapple another fixture here and then it would disconnect from here, so then it's able to, to walk from one part of the station to the other part like this. So that's also one of the big flexibilities of this robotic arm. It can walk and it can be based on a wagon here on a rail track and so it's, it can move actually and do things in various parts of the station. So that's very smart and very uh, very f uh, reliable also. So here you can see almost everything of the uh, robotics uh, uh, system of the station, which is again developed by the Canadians. 
So that's the robotic station here, inside the station, in the, what we call the cupola, which is a very nice viewpoint for the station. It's underneath the station, and uh, you see that there are some windows. So that's, uh, it w unfortunately, it was not there when I flew, and it arrived a few years after. And, uh, but that's a very nice place to be, definitely. And you see all the elements of the, of the robotics workstation here with the, the joysticks and controllers. And uh, one of the tasks of the crew now, um, maybe I should mention that in the beginning, all the robotic tasks were performed by the crew members only. But it, it's, it's time consuming. And uh, now, um, <clears throat> for a few years now, the ground controllers are able to control the arm. And the crew is doing less and less robotic tasks. So the ones which are remaining for the crew is grappling this vehicle because you can imagine that when the ground controllers are uh, controlling the arm there are some delays uh, because all these commands and telemetry takes time it takes two three seconds to to uh, to uh, um, arrive or to reach the station um, so if the vehicle is moving a little bit uh, you cannot do that from the ground so the so far the crew is the only uh, the crew only is doing the is grappling the, the, the cargo vehicles. And the ground is doing all the other tasks which are only working with uh, station equipment. Station equipment outside the station. Okay, as I told you, uh, weightlessness is not, is not a friend for the human being. Uh, so there are a lot of medical exams which are done. I, I, I saw you before. Um, an instrument for me measuring muscle atrophy. There was a problem which was discovered a few years ago in the station. It's a, uh, what we call the <coughs> VIIP, uh, not VIP, but VIIP, visual impairment and intracranial pressure. So what, what it is actually, it's degradation of the vision of the astronauts due to some effects, side effects of the weightlessness and, and mainly to the increase of the pressure inside the, the, the crane. So this is not something that which is monitored um, very uh, carefully during the whole mission. But there are also all the exams that we have to do during the mission because as you can imagine, <coughs> we want to check regularly the health of the astronaut on board uh, because that's very important, not only for the program, but also for them. You can, you can figure out that, I guess. Uh, so this instrument is used for measuring, um, the, I guess that's for measuring the pressure of the eye, actually. But there are other, we have ultrasound also for monitoring the eyes. This is, uh, this is very important. Um, health maintenance, if you don't do anything during six months, no, no exercise in, inside the station. So you will be like someone who spent six months on a bed in a hospital. So that's, of course, very... Uh, bad for the for the uh, for the for the your your body, and uh, so every day there are almost two hours, almost two hours of exercise to be done by the astronauts. And this is one of the instrument which is used for this one is for muscle training, um, and uh, we we have two other ones, one for cardio training, which is a sort of bike, and, uh, and there is another one, which is a treadmill actually. And uh, these two instruments are the basis of all the health maintenance uh, for, the, uh, for the astronauts and cosmonauts on board. Uh, maintenance of the station itself. This is also, of course, very important. When <coughs> Thomas Pesquet, a French astronaut, arrived on board on the first week, the toilets failed <laughs> on, the, on the US side. And uh, hopefully there is another toilet on the, <laughs> on the Russian side. Um, but you can imagine when you have six people for just one toilet, that's not very good, of course. And uh, during this first week of his mission, we were really feeling the motivation of the crew to repair this uh, US toilet very quickly to be able to recover the second set of, of toilets for the, for the crew. That's very important. But that's, that's just one example, of course. But you can imagine the same thing for other things like uh, uh, carbon dioxide removal or this kind of or water production or everything has to work of course 
uh, well and to be uh, reliable enough so that you don't spend all your days by repairing these things. Of course, that's very important. But we're also progressing in this, uh, in this area. So this was, by the way, maintenance of um, <coughs> the carbon dioxide uh, removal system of the station. That's uh, Jeff Williams. That's a picture from 2015 or 14, I think. And that's a big rack that you see here, which has been tilted and uh, Jeff is working on it. Education, I told you, that's uh, also something which is uh, very important. Um, the astronauts are spending a lot of time to perform some uh, education experiments. So th that means experiments wh which are um, um, created and, uh, and developed uh, by schools and students. Um, and this, uh, this is happening regularly. And there are also a lot of in flight, what we call in flight calls, or the astronauts will talk to, to students, uh, or to the public, or to. Uh, so there is a lot of activities in the station which are done to, for this return to the education, to, let's say, to motivate the young people for math and physics and science and all these kind of things. So, um, so Thomas here is a recording a video message for UNICEF. So that's one part of the of these activities, but he spent a lot of time doing that. That's part of the normal work, but he also spent a lot of time doing uh, all the social media stuff, which is actually not really part of the daily work. So he had to do that in the evening. And uh, uh, <clears throat> when he came back, he told us that that was also very time consuming. So this is something new because in the past, we didn't have these social media tools on board. So. Now the crew has an co internet connection and is able to do all these things, but there's also additional work, of course, for the, for the crew members. Public relation, I told you, this was with, um, with the Academy of Science in Paris. So that was one of the things that Thomas did during his mission. And uh, the last, I think that's the last uh, slide. The idea was to play an organ in, uh, in Montreal, in Canada from on board the station using an iPad. So it was, let's, let's say, an attempt to do it. Uh, there were some technical issues, but uh, uh, so just to show you one of the things we are asking the astronauts to do from time to time. So there was a lot of, of people in this uh, opera in, uh, in Montreal. OK, I think that's, I will show you the return. So I, I talk, because I don't have time anymore, but uh, I, I want to leave time for your questions. But uh, I will show you the, um, how the crew is inside the Soyuz for the return. So that's, that's the arrival. When you are touching, well, it's more than that probably, but it's very, very short, on a very short time. But um, I, I, will, I don't have time to show you everything, but uh, as you see, the final part, there is just the central part of the Soyuz, which is remaining. The other parts have been separated and burned in the atmosphere. So the parachute is opening a few kilometers above the ground. And then uh, when you arrive at about one meter from the ground, there, there are some retro rockets that will fire. You will see that here uh, underneath here. And uh, this is for just slowing down the vehicle just before you hit the ground. So the, uh, the video from inside the, the module that I, I showed you before, don't be afraid if you see a lot of fire and smoke here, that's normal landing. So that was just to slow down the vehicle. So that makes the arrival a little bit less uh, rough, let's say, for the, for the crew, harsh for the crew. Um, and uh, uh, so we will see the same thing from inside. So you see that's the retro rockets firing. Then you have the second, uh, let's say, vibration, which is hitting the ground. And usually the, the module is still, you know, rotating a little bit. So there, we, we saw very briefly a third uh, motion of the vehicle at the end. So you see one, two. And it's still moving, and then it stopped now. Okay, so you see how the, the arrival is inside the Soyuz. 
And that's, of course, the nice part because then you have to go out of the equal and usually it's not very easy. When you spend six months in weightlessness, all of a sudden being out and starting try to, to start to walk and uh, to do normal things of life is not that easy and you're usually feeling some motion sickness. And uh, <clears throat> usually be, after you come back, there is uh, several weeks of uh, what we call rehab, uh, rehabilitation, so that's based on physical exercise and just to be able to come back slowly in the same state that you were before you launch. Okay? All right. Sorry, I've been a little bit longer than I expected, but uh, um, I'm ready to take any question. And I have I have no time limitation. Uh, they let me know, of course. But and that's of course depend on your time also. But uh, um, I'm ready to take questions. You like these pictures? <laughs> Thank you.